always been a builder and a tinkerer. In third grade, I had this bright idea that I could fix a burnt out light bulb by breaking the case and taping the two ends of the filament back together. I don't recommend trying this. It fused my entire house and nearly electrocuted me. But since then, my skills have improved. By age 25, I thought I had my life and career all figured out. By then, I'd already spent 10 years working in AI, building algorithms to help computers reason intelligently like humans do. I moved from one sci-fi sounding project to another, building algorithms for robots to designing smart digital assistants. And then, in 2007, I was in Silicon Valley, considered to be the mecca of AI. When it hit me, at the very best, my greatest inventions would read, a better spam filter. Who cared about that? Not me. That's not why I got in this field. I realized I wanted to make more of a personal, meaningful impact. So to explore this, I started collaborating with a group of neonatologists, physicians who take care of premature babies. These are tiny, fragile babies at risk for major unforeseen complications. And we asked, could we design algorithms to identify which babies are prone to complications? To explore this, we worked together for two and a half years and made some very exciting discoveries. Let me show you. So here, I'm showing you data from babies' heart rates right after they're born. Every row here is a baby's heart rate data. The big surprising fact I learned was that while doctors couldn't tell apart which babies were okay and which babies were in trouble, our algorithms could. Here's how we did it. We designed algorithms to find chunks of the signal that are similar across babies and across time. This is an approach to AI called machine learning, where we, computers are taught to infer patterns from data instead of the rules being hand programmed by human experts. Here in this image, the red chunks are similar and the blue chunks are similar and so on. Next, we group these different colored chunks and what I'm showing you here is the relative frequency in 30 babies of these different colored chunks in the first 48 hours of life. So every column here is a baby's data from the first 48 hours. And the babies who had a lot of blues and reds did fine, versus the babies who had a lot of greens and pink did really poorly. This correlation between the baby's health status and their heart rate patterns was not at all obvious from staring at the signal alone. It was quite subtle. If you've given birth, You've seen nurses hand compute the score called the APGAR score. They use this to assess how the baby is doing outside the mother's womb. We took the heart rate data and a variety of other signal types and we combined them to compute a score just like the APGAR score, but much more accurate at predicting the baby's outcome. Let me show you an example. This is baby Lucas's score. So baby Lucas, our algorithm thinks, is not doing so well at birth. Our algorithm does not have access to baby Lucas's diagnoses. Turns out, baby Lucas had a heart complication. To fix his heart complication, his doctors gave him a medication, but this medication ended up causing his kidneys to fail. On day four, they decide to do surgery on him. Again, our algorithm cannot see any of this treatment data, but it's tracking closely with baby Lucas's health 
and predicting that Lucas isn't doing so well until after day four when it can see that Lucas's health is resolving and it sees that much before it was clinically apparent. On a group of 150 preemies, we showed that by combining these different data, we could predict with 90% accuracy which babies were prone to major complications. This was 2010. We published this in a prominent medical journal, expecting it to have big impact. Right around then, I got recruited across the country to a major medical institution, Johns Hopkins, to direct the machine learning and healthcare lab there. We use these techniques across many different conditions. Like our work with preemies, we focused on conditions that were prevalent, life-threatening, and there was an opportunity to make a major impact by diagnosing the condition earlier. We could see possibilities everywhere. We published paper after paper. And then something very terrible happened in my life. Um, my nephew, a perfectly healthy adult, recently married, fell ill one day, um, and he was taken to the hospital. There, he ended up um, dying of sepsis. It shook up my entire family. Now, sepsis happens to be one of a half dozen conditions I happen to be working in. In sepsis, the most promising way to save a patient's life is by diagnosing the condition earlier and treating it. And in fact, my research had shown that it's possible to identify sepsis early using machine learning. Yet, when my mother and sister called, I realized I could do nothing to save my nephew. My research had made no practical difference. This lit a fire in me. As I looked across our field, I saw there were many novel findings that people were beginning to publish, showing potential for AI to impact outcomes. Yet, none of these ideas had made it to the patient bedside. I started to wonder, what would it take to translate these findings from the lab to everyday patient care. I called upon experts, a diversity of experts, integration engineers, infrastructure engineers, nurses, doctors, quality improvement experts, and human computer interaction researchers. Together, we built a platform to deliver targeted real-time early warning solutions for identifying patients at risk for major complications. But we encountered barriers at every level. In fact, it was an absolute obstacle course. Electronic medical records, they were close to us. Finning clinician trust, we needed it, but we didn't have it. Clear financial incentives for hospitals, we didn't have those either. We needed to create them. So electronic medical records, or EMRs, is the system where when you visit your doctor, that's where they're entering your data. Clinicians are really busy people. They're not going to use a system that isn't deeply integrated within workflow. Now, despite the enormous investments that's gone into EMRs, it remains very challenging to integrate with them. EMR companies are zealous about maintaining control over patient data. Yes, they have to care about patient privacy, 
but they also want to stay in control. Let's contrast this to the internet. Today, you can access all sorts of services on the internet, like a banking application, ride sharing, restaurant finder, some other services I won't name. Now, imagine if the internet were policed by a couple of private companies that determine which apps got built. You wouldn't have access to all these amazing services that make your life easy and great. I think bringing AI to health and medicine will become a lot easier when EMR companies become more accessible for other systems to work with. And this could be due to increased patient demand, competitive pressure, or government regulation. I don't care how we get there, but we need to get there. I want to see EMR companies open up their doors a little bit more. It would be so great if they could enable easy integration for any service that is fully secure, thoughtful about patient privacy, and doing patients good. And if they did, they could help power the internet of personalized medicine. Now, the second barrier we ran into on this obstacle course was lack of trust. In order to benefit from our algorithms, clinicians needed to use them. After all, if they don't use them, patients aren't going to see any benefit. But for them to use them, they needed to trust it. And winning clinician trust was not easy. We had to move away from black box algorithms to transparent algorithms, where they could easily see why our algorithms were flagging a patient. We had to make it very easy for them to be able to reason with, collaborate, and agree or disagree with what the machine had inferred. When we first deployed our system for sepsis, only a handful of physicians were using it. It was really disappointing. After 12 months and many, many iterations, we got to 90% adoption. I'm proud of that. And now in a multi-site study across five hospitals, we see very exciting data. We're seeing significant improvements in the number of lives saved. This is the first such result of its kind showing the use of AI in reducing mortality. And now you might ask, are hospitals rushing to implement this? Well, yes and no. And this points to the third major barrier. Systems like ours save lives, but hospitals are not rewarded for saving lives. They're rewarded for doing more procedures. When we prevent a patient from getting septic, some hospitals lose money. Obviously, they want to do right by the patients, but the system does not reward them for it. So if we want technologies like these to get adopted, I realized it's not just enough to improve patient outcomes. You also have to align with financial incentives of the healthcare organization. So these were some of the strategies, pushing for increased access, winning clinician trust, and identifying clear financial incentives. And the success of these strategies with sepsis was not a fluke. Since then, we've developed solutions in three other clinical areas where AI can prevent deaths. And we're already beginning to deploy this across multiple hospitals. As a society, we're trained to celebrate a new discovery, that initial leap of genius. Yet, what this whole experience has taught me is that to get an idea from the initial discovery to the bedside is going to be more like navigating an obstacle course that requires multiple breakthroughs sustained innovation and unrelenting grit. It's not going to be easy, but I take comfort in the fact that I run into hardworking, driven people almost every day. People who see what the future holds and they want to be a part of it. People who see the potential 
And they say, I want it. I want it for my patients. How can I help? What can I do to make things go faster? The good news is there's something all of us can do to help. Clinicians, for one, you can start by learning a few of the basics of machine learning and AI. And I don't mean learning how to program computers. I just mean going beyond the media hype. AI is not that scary. It's simple. In fact, it's less cool than the media makes it sound. AI can help you make connections in your patient's data that you can't always see. Some clinicians are worried about AI replacing them. But think of it. Think of it like a Spider-Man suit. It makes you stronger, and it is useless without you. AI can also be a time saver. AI-based EMR workflows are much faster than non-AI systems because it can pull all the relevant data for you at the right time when you need it. For hospital leaders, this is a great opportunity to strike contracts with your insurers so that you get paid appropriately for quality outcomes. How can we make investments in proactive, preventative care make financial sense? We want saving lives to be a financial no-brainer and not just the right thing to do. And finally, all of us as patients have a major role to play. We can talk to our elected representatives and let them know that these ma barriers matter to us. We don't want our data locked up in a couple of EMRs. We can demand that hospitals be incentivized for quality outcomes. The louder we demand change, the faster we will see it. When I think about my career, I have regrets that my work didn't migrate into the healthcare field earlier. I have regrets um, when I think about my nephew. And if I had started working in sepsis five years before I did, I wonder if his doctors would have detected his sepsis earlier. And if he would have been here with us today. But I also think about the fact that if we do work together, we will get there faster and many, many more lives can be saved. I take inspiration from the words of a great humanitarian who famously said, None of us, including me, ever do great things. But we can all do small things with great love. And together, we can do something wonderful. Thank you.